he has worked with inclusive publishing for over 25 years. Here to tell us more about accessibility initiatives around the globe. Please welcome Richard Orm. Thank you so much for that kind uh, in, uh, introduction, and it's lovely to be with you. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in Malmo uh, today, but I still have my unused airline ticket from uh, the beginning of this year, so I hope to get to you soon. So today I'll be talking to you today about global accessibility initiatives and really trying to describe some examples of what's happening beyond the Nordic uh, region. And so in this session, let me talk a little bit about me, introduce myself, and then we'll set off on a world tour of inclusive publishing. So as you mentioned, I've worked for a long time uh, in accessible uh, publishing and in access to materials for people with disabilities. I started this career when I was a college lecturer uh, and I had my first blind student and we had to work together to find ways for him to access his learning. Uh, like some of the speakers who've already mentioned this, I have personal connections uh, to uh, a, a, a special needs for access to reading. Uh, my grandmother went blind and so she used audiobooks to continue reading in her later life. I have a brother with a severe learning disability. Uh, he actually features on the last slide of the video that maybe some of you have seen at lunch. Um, and I have a son who has dyslexia and he's just started at university studying um, uh, aerospace engineering. And like Molly mentioned, uh, individuals have such individual needs. And my son, for example, uh, as someone with dyslexia, uh, he unusually doesn't use the text-to-speech uh, capabilities that he has. What he really enjoys is being able to customize the colors, the font, the spacing uh, of his ebooks, and that's what means reading uh, becomes less of a chore and more of something that he enjoys with his studying. Now, I work at the DAISY Consortium, which, mean, which is an organization uh, with members all around the world, and we partner with organizations and initiatives to bring about inclusive publishing. So I hope today in this armchair travel, we'll be able to uh, see what's happening with examples from the USA, from Canada and Brazil, uh, Italy, the Netherlands, Kenya, UK, and also an international uh, example too. And there are so many common activities between them, but in each example, I'll highlight one element which I think is notable. So let's start in the USA. Um, and several of our speakers have talked about practical guidance uh, and uh, um, clear information from the industry to the industry. One of the industry organizations in the US is BISG, the Book Industry Study Group. Uh, they work right through the distribution chain and they produce a quick start guide um, on accessible publishing. So in your list of resources to go away and read, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, but I think it's true to say that US academic publishers and the platforms that are used to bring uh, books and journal articles to students in the US are really in the vanguard of born accessible materials, particularly the more complex materials. In order to uh, help this move along and for implementation to be successful, I want to mention that there is a higher education working group. This informal group meets about every two weeks uh, by Zoom call. It includes publishers, uh, the platform providers, universities and accessibility experts. And through this, we uncover what the latest challenges are, uh, what the issues are for either publishers or for end users, and we problem solve together. And through this, we develop events too to help with the successful uptake of inclusive published um, materials. One of these events I want to particularly mention are the publisher face-off events, where publishers will submit um, some of their latest titles that are part of their um, main kind of frontless uh, efforts, recent uh, titles, into a program where they're then uh, examined by accessibility experts and people with reading disabilities, and then they're commented on in a public format, and we compare and contrast the different approaches. It's very brave of publishers to do this, but I have to say that 
the results are just astounding and very, very encouraging. The lengths that these publishers are going to, to create really high quality and accessible materials that are just there. They're on the same uh, pl distribution platforms, access through the same reading apps, and they have descriptions and structured titles and extended descriptions and so on. These are great ways for people both to showcase what they're doing and also learn where they could do better. Um, and there are the industry events too, like Digital Book World Conference, and these have taken accessibility to their hearts, and they now include an annual accessibility award in there. Also, the USA is a place where some of the world's largest accessibility conferences happen. And what I've noticed in the last few years is that publishing and publishers are showing up to these events. So they're no longer just about web accessibility and access to employment and so on. Uh, they actually have publishers uh, coming and talking about what they're doing and meeting with end users, uh, doing, doing user trials uh, and user uh, interactions and so on. So this is a really interesting feature. And disability organizations like the National Federation of the Blind recently held an inclusive publishing conference all around working together for an accessible future in digital content. So the thing I want to call out about the USA as a particularly interesting thing maybe to look into further is Global Certified Accessible. And this is a program of third party uh, accessibility certification uh, for uh, publishers, particularly those selling into uh, at the education um, marketplace. This is where um, the workflow of a publisher is examined. The books coming off that production line uh, go through um, examination, not only against the standards, but with human inspection and with end user testing. And they improve and improve and improve that workflow to the point that they can then certify that workflow and claim that within the titles themselves in the metadata. Let's now go north of the border to Canada. And there's been significant interest in accessibility from various bodies in Canada. Uh, the industry groups like BookNet Canada, but also working together with the disability organizations like CNIB, which is a, the major blindness organization, CELA and NELS, who are the specialist library organizations there. And the industry has long held digital publishing uh, events such as Tech Forum and eBook Craft, and these have always included uh, an attention to accessibility. And as part of these, NELS conduct a testing initiative and an annual conference all around accessible uh, publishing. What's particularly notable about Canada, and some of you may know this, is that the Government have uh, announced funding in 2019 of 22.8 Canadian, uh, 22.8 million Canadian dollars, which will be uh, deployed over five years, which is all about supporting the production of accessible uh, ebooks from independent uh, publishers. And as a early deliverable in this, uh, an accessibility landscape report was published uh, in the early part of this year. And this looks at things like the state of the nation, the readiness of the, the publishers and the vendors there, also around marketing and awareness and the potential for a certification uh, program for Canada. So I think that's probably the example to pull out from the country of Canada. The notable is the willingness of the Canadian government to fund an initiative to support the sustainable production and distribution of accessible digital books by Canadian uh, publishers. Let's now head down to Latin America, to Brazil. And in Brazil, actually, they have strong regulation and laws around uh, inclusion. And one of these is the inclusion of persons with disabilities law, which means that customers can request accessible versions of books, in fact, of any book that's sold in a bookstore or online. And usually when this is provided to them, this is a well-structured EPUB 3, including image descriptions. And the regulations, they impose various things like timescales about how quickly that has to be turned around and provided to the reader. Uh, and these vary according to how popular that book is and the complexity of the book. The, the, it varies between it has to be available from the time it goes on sale through to allowing 60 days to provide that to the end user. 
There's lots of government procurement in Brazil, uh, and as part of that public procurement, books that go into libraries and schools must have digital uh, accessible versions. And since 2019, the school books for primary education are also produced in Braille. So notable in Brazil, I think, is the combination of consumer law, which provides protections for people with disabilities, together with a significant program of public procurement driving forward accessible publishing uh, in education. Where should we go next? Let's go briefly to Italy because we've already heard from uh, the LIA Foundation and this was described well by Christina at the beginning of the day. Um, and she told us how in 2014 the Italian Publishers Association and the Italian Blind Union set up this non-profit organization uh, to expand access to mainstream publications. And um, Christina also explained how the, the very wide range of activities that the foundation conduct including research and participating in the standards groups, operating a certification scheme, offering consulting and training, conversion services, and end user awareness um, events. Um, the uh, foundation has received several Italian and international um, awards and now are scaling up that publisher training uh, and the end user awareness events. And so I think notable about Italy is that they established this new organization, which was a joint uh, um, initiative between publishers and the disability organizations. And Christina explained how now this is broadened to include education um, services and the dyslexia organizations. And this is all focused on accessible publishing in the mainstream with such a wide range of uh, activities that are happening uh, there. Let's now move uh, briefly to the Netherlands, uh, where Dedicon is the organization and in fact the DAISY member who have been the focus on accessible publishing in the Netherlands. And they've described to me how they began this journey with a series of roundtable discussions back in 2016, which was all around the topic of how to improve the adoption of born accessible practices within the mainstream publishing area. And through those discussions, they identified what the immediate priorities would be. And amongst the first deliverables were guidelines for Dutch publishers appropriate uh, for uh, the marketplace there in the Netherlands. So uh, there are three main areas of activity in the Born Accessible Publishing project, uh, and some of these will be fam feeling familiar to you by now from hearing from the different examples I've given and from the speakers that we've heard from. So around awareness and knowledge building, around creating quick start accessibility guidance and understanding that this is a journey, and activities to boost this inclusive publishing through tools, through workshops, and through consultancy. So I want to highlight here as a specific thing that Dedicon and those involved uh, in this initiative recognize that this is a multi-year activity uh, and the, it has evolved from roundtable discussions, collaborating with other countries, and now they're considering things like um, a help desk for user groups, uh, enabling people and supporting people to take up the benefits uh, of accessible publishing. Let's go over to the continent of Africa now, to Kenya. And I think this example shows how a marketplace that's at the very beginning of digital adoption is still able to unlock the potential of inclusive publishing. Over there, the Digital Literacy Trust is an organization that includes publishers, distribution platforms, international development agencies, disabled persons, organizations, and vendors. And the DAISY Consortium is proud to be a member of the Digital Literacy Trust. Uh, DLT has a strong focus on educational resources and the members of this based in Kenya partner with the government's existing digitization efforts, which there is called DigiSchool Project, where they deployed 1.2 million tablets and laptops to 22,000 Kenyan public schools uh, to over 5 million students and teachers, including many teachers and students um, with disabilities. One of the really neat things I think they did is that they created a downloadable toolkit which enabled publishers with a framework to start producing accessible EPUB 3. And they run a content development challenge for publishers. So they, they take the framework, EPUB files and other examples, and then they create um, 
uh, accessible publications based on what they do as a publisher. And I've seen some wonderful examples of school books uh, that have now been uh, converted to accessible EPUB 3 and are now the digital format that go into schools. Uh, the partners in Kenya, who are called Ikitabu, which is uh, Kiswahili for ebook, uh, they contribute to the Redium developments that Luke and others have referred to. And I saw comments in the chat earlier about, you know, what about a desktop um, solution for Windows? They actually leverage the Thorium Reader app because it's open source and they create their own Ikitabu uh, reader based on the Thorium Reader app and they contribute to its development. And like some of the other examples I've given you, they were recognized by the ABC International Excellence Awards, of which more in a little uh, moment. And so for Kenya, I just want to highlight that uh, a country which is um, at the beginning of using digital resources and with many economic constraints, they are also able to make big progress uh, in inclusive publishing um, for people with disabilities. Now I'm speaking to you today from the United Kingdom indeed, uh, so it would be maybe wrong if I didn't talk to you a little bit about what we're doing here in the UK. And over many years, there have been trainings on accessibility, uh, which have been hosted through the trade bodies, uh, where, which already have their membership and their audiences and their training programs. And so they include within these um, training specifically on accessibility. And examples would be through the Publishers Licensing Society, uh, the book industry communications. For some of those from outside the publishing industry, sometimes we're surprised just how many organizations there are within publishing uh, and we must work uh, together and through all of those organizations to reach the different audiences. Uh, this was also mentioned I think by Hampus and by our speakers uh, who were just on. Um, through the uh, through the links that come through that, uh, people with uh, disabilities and accessibility experts are invited into the publishing companies to give presentations and personal experiences of reading, um, accessible reading, and what's that like for people with disabilities. As has been mentioned a few times, this is so powerful to have someone coming into your uh, own publishing company where they can give a presentation maybe to quite a broad audience over a lunch break or someone, and people can get their hands on reading reading as using the same tools that are used by someone with dyslexia or with low vision, with a physical disability or with a screen reader. And for someone to see their own content being read, read through these accessibility tools is really a very, very motivating and really gets a conversation started. And in a similar way, uh, we worked uh, at, with uh, London-based universities to host events in the university library where publishers, uh, disability service officers, um, and uh, people who create uh, reading systems came along and had a chance to try out in a university setting uh, some of the things that students with disabilities would be looking to do with their content. Uh, so we set some tasks like see if you can change the colours. Can you get it to read with text to speech? Are you able to navigate this table? And people through that saw, even if they'd created the most wonderful accessible content on that journey from the publisher through the distribution and into the reading system, that things can go well. So everything needs to work well across that and through that distribution chain. And so that was just fascinating to see this happening and also happening within a university uh, itself with students with disabilities and librarians supporting disabled students as part of, of this event. And the London Book Fair itself is one of the world's largest uh, publishing events, and this has included accessibility seminars, which update people um, on the latest developments for more than uh, more than ten years. And the Publishers Association, which is the leading organisation in the UK uh, for publishers, they host an accessibility action group, which is a forum for people to exchange information. And we talked about rights. This came up just now about uh, captions, maybe for audiobooks. This actually was the, the, the place where we resolved some policy challenges uh, around ebooks and being able to use with text to speech. When this first became possible, there was lots of anxiety about whether or not this breached uh, audio rights and so on. And by getting around a table, authors, uh, uh, rights negotiators, uh, the technology companies, disability organizations, we were able to actually to work through some of those issues. And the PA was some of the strongest, the Publishers Association was str some of the strongest advocates for 
you're then pushing uh, forward uh, the, the practice that uh, ebooks should be uh, released with uh, text to speech enabled um, as, an, as a right. So notable for the UK is this forum that exists, which has open membership, practical and specific uh, topics. And I'm looking forward to our next meeting next month, where our incoming chair is actually uh, a young blind woman. So the last uh, example I want to give is in fact an international organization. Uh, WIPO is the UN agency responsible for the Marrakesh Treaty, which we've heard a little about, and they host the Accessible Books Consortium. Luke mentioned this um, earlier. They have three strands, including capacity building for uh, developing countries in particular, but two other things I want to mention under their inclusive publishing strand. One is the ABC International Excellent Awards, uh, which is awarded each year at the London Book Fair. And in fact, some of your uh, speakers earlier have been recipients uh, of this award, uh, both the uh, uh, Leah Foundation and um, also Hachette Livre uh, as well. I hope I'm not missing any, any out. Uh, but this is a real motivator and it sits within a set of excellence awards for the publishing industry. So they have those for the best publisher and uh, lots of other things related to publishing. And within this accessibility uh, gets um, profile and it's great to have this international excellence award there. And they also have the ABC Charter for Accessible Publishing, which is an eight point commitment for publishers to continue down the road of accessible publishing. And in fact, the hundredth organization to sign was Hachette uh, Livre. So there's international activity happening with WIPO and the International Publishers Association too. So in closing, let me bring together these lessons maybe from this uh, armchair travel around the world. Um, so the points I picked out were the power of the purchaser uh, can drive progress. This is where this certification scheme has come through. US universities are demanding accessible titles and certification gives them assurance and this is an advantage in the marketplace. But also government dollars or government funding can really help an industry take the steps. And this is the example from Canada with their amazing five year program uh, there. Consumer protection laws are one approach, and maybe this is uh, part of what the European Accessibility Act brings, and also a common approach uh, across the EU marketplace. And that was the example from Brazil, together with industry bodies themselves taking the initiative. And wasn't it great that the Italian Publishers uh, Association took that um, approach of setting up that organization to drive it forward? And a planned approach was the example from the Netherlands, uh, focusing on the next important issues and working through together with a body of stakeholders to identify what those next steps were and not imagining everything could be done on day zero. There's the lesson from Kenya that countries that are emerging in the field of digital publishing can still do great things and there they provided frameworks for the publishers to work from and that people can really appreciate the quality resources. Actually, I cut the slide out from Australia because it was mentioned in fact in the very opening, uh, but they have those great resources that they've produced in Australia, a guide to the, um, the requirements of the law uh, and copyright issues, but also the kind of steps to take uh, on inclusive publishing. The shared forum was the example I gave from the UK. And then finally, the global message is this is a global movement. Uh, it's fantastic that the Nordic countries participating in this event are working together and sharing. But actually, as you've seen from these examples, there is so much wonderful activity happening all around the world. One of Christina's messages was don't reinvent the wheel. So let's join hands together. We can do this together. And one little step maybe is for the publishers participating in this conference is to join the ABC Charter for Accessible Publishing. So there we are. We have uh, uh, lessons from around the world and I'm very happy to take questions if we have time. 
Thank you very much, Richard. We do have to go to break, but I have to just throw in one question. Uh, this was incredibly inspirational, um, uh, but also a little bit, I think some may feel aspirational, for if, especially if you're a smaller uh, language group. I was gracefully reminded when I was a little bit vague about the population of Iceland earlier today that they are almost 350,000. But even in, Sweden, of, in, even in Sweden, of course, it's it's uh, 10 million. And, and out of these countries with these great examples, Dutch, I think, is the smallest uh, language group with uh, 24 uh, million first uh, language speakers, if you count Belgium as well. So so I wonder, do you know, have you seen examples from smaller language areas? Uh, or are the, Because on the other hand, the principles you listed at the end are, are largely the same. Um, so I think you're you're right. Lots of the maybe the first mover, it's the same answer as the uh, as the person from Amazon who spoke earlier. These tend to move more quickly, but as Luke explained, the the, the technologies we're dealing in, and in, indeed the tools we're working with, are those of the open web, and these are international. Um, and so uh, the, the the tools and solutions that exist uh, can work in many many different languages. We look forward to uh, working more and more with the smaller language uh, groups. Groups. I don't think the technology is the barrier in this case. Okay, that's wonderful. And I've seen you've been very active uh, in, in the chat already today. So, of course, everyone, if you have questions for Richard, uh, let's, uh, let's put them there. Uh, Richard, thank you very much uh, for your time.